श्रीमती महुआ मोहित्रा जी I stand here today to speak on the demand for grants for the Union Ministry of Civil Aviation. Civil Aviation in India has a very illustrious history. The first official air mail service in the world originated in India on February 18, 1911, when Henry Piquet, the French aviator, carried 6,500 pieces of mail across the Yamuna from Allahabad to Delhi on a humble summer biplane. The first commercial airline. A Tata service, Tata Air Services flight was piloted by J.R.D. Tata, a postmoth, in October 1932 from Karachi to Bombay at a dazzling 100 miles an hour. Fast forward to 1953, when the Air Corporations Act nationalised the industry, and eight domestic airlines were merged into two: Indian Airlines and Air India International. In 2011, these were again combined into one: Air India, a single entity. But now, with the privatisation of Air India last month. which was the last government airline in the 70th year of its nationalization there is no point in discussing its privatization anymore who was for it who was against it it is already a fait accompli and we need to move on we can only hope that this government has put in enough rules and reasonable processes for aircrafts to be made available for the prompt the private sector for emergencies as and when required by the government of india as we've seen in the case of ukraine and many others in the last few years As I analyze the numbers, I find that from 2014 till today, Air India formed between 60 and 95 percent of the Ministry of Civil Aviation's budget. The sale of Air India, basically an airline that cost the exchequer about 120,000 crores over the past 10 years due to gross mismanagement, is being now lauded as a landmark success. But Air India seemed to be the only thing that this ministry was doing, or rather, doing quite badly. It is incumbent upon me as a responsible public citizen and a public representative to point out to taxpayers of this country what is the truth behind these ministers ministries numbers we need to really analyze them this year of course completely skews the numbers and it's difficult for a lay person to figure out what's going on first let's look at the air india related expenses last year's revised estimate had 62000 crores as debt repayment and the budget estimate for 2223 includes almost 9300 crores towards the spv air india asset holding for debt servicing excuse me sir once we exclude air india then the total allocation for the ministry is down 31% over last year's revised estimates the total budget estimate for 2223 for non air india expenditure is a grand total of only 1242 crores This is a reduction of 31% over the 1770 crores revised for 2122. Let us look at the breakup. First, establishment expenditure 435 crores increase of 12% over revised estimate. The regional connectivity scheme. This is the much touted Uran airports Iran routes. Only 601 crores, a decrease of over 40% over revised estimate of 994 crores. 3 Airports Authority of India 150 crores decrease of 21% over revised estimate others 57 crores reduction of 78% I would like to ask one question with a paltry budget expenditure of 1240 crores why do we need a separate ministry for civil aviation 1200 crores is what Mr Gadkari is spending to four lane a stretch of 67 kilometers in my district The Mandrega budget for my state is almost three times this amount. People should be aware that there is no country in the world, apart from India and Bangladesh, which has a separate and independent ministry for civil aviation. No one else. Everyone has evolved as they have sold and privatized their national carriers. I'm going to name a few examples: the U.S. Department of Transport, Canada Transport Canada, U.K. Department for Transport, Germany Federal Ministry for Digital and Transport. Singapore which still owns 55% in Singapore Airlines through Temasek Ministry of Transport Japan Ministry of Land Infrastructure and Transport the question i raise here or rather the proposal i put forward is that now that this ministry is no longer in the business of running a national airline why does it even need to be a separate ministry what is it actually doing why not merge the ministry of civil aviation with the road transport or the shipping ministry and create a holistic ministry for transport the airports authority of india A mini Ratna, it's a CPSE, is now the mainstay of the entire civil aviation ministry, and barring the regional connectivity RCS subsidy of about 600 crores, which incidentally is a huge underperformer, there are no big sums to be managed here at all. Even the important air nav navigation services is solely mandated to AI. 
BCAS, the regulator, does nothing except issue aviation security circulars and conduct routine audit checks. It has a revenue budget of only 67 crores for salaries and a capital budget of only 30 crores for making a new building and for some biometric project that they're doing. All actual airport and installation security is handled by CISF, which reports to Home Ministry, doesn't report to Ministry of Civil Aviation. Let us examine the Airports Authority of India. What exactly are they doing? In the year 1920, which was the last available public report that I could find, AI earned a profit about 2,000 crores, which was revenue share from eight PPP airports and fees from domestic and overflight services. It gave 1,000 crores as dividend to the Consolidated Fund of India, but the government did not even find it worthwhile to allocate at least this amount to the regional connectivity, the Uran scheme. Can you imagine the regional connectivity Uran scheme that my esteemed colleague who's speaking before me from the BJP mentioned has been reduced by 40%. The RCS scheme was introduced in 2016 by the ministry to stimulate regional air connectivity and make air travel more affordable. In 2016, this government sanctioned 948 new air routes to serve underserved areas to boost connectivity. But as of January 31st, 2002, only 404 routes have been operationalized. That's only 43%. Your five-year budget for RCS from 1617 to 2122 was 4,500 crores. As of December 2021, only 2,100 crores, just 46% has been spent. So 50% of your 1,200 crore budget is RCS, and RCS itself is a non-starter. You yourself must be realizing this, otherwise why would you cut the budget down 40%? The Standing Committee report says there are huge delays in operationalizing because airlines are not willing to operate on RCS routes. So it is established beyond doubt that the ministry and indeed this government is not in the business of either running an airline or controlling commercial aviation in India. In which case, let the government do away with this ministry, merge it into a larger consolidated transport ministry, and instead concentrate on making life easier for those private players who are the only ones operating in the Indian airspace today. There's no government play, it's only private, let's make life easier for private players. This government has seen, actually both the UPA and the NDA, how hard it is to run an airline successfully in this country. We have written off over 100,000 crores of public exchequer's money in Air India. Even then, this government refuses, absolutely refuses, to take any steps when it comes to fixing the taxes on aviation turbine, turbine fuel ATF that are crippling this industry with every upcycle of crude price. Either reducing the VAT and excise duties on a pan-India level or starting the path to putting ATF into GST where they can get input tax credit. Otherwise, with the crude price of oil the way it's going, there's a huge risk of the entire sector getting back into the doldrums as we had seen in 2012-14. Now you have no longer Air India to cross-subsidize, so reduce ATF taxes. If cumbersome small regional aircrafts and airline regulations can be streamlined without impacting um, safety, there is no reason why our country can't see small airports regionally, both cargo and passengers. We see this model all over the world. I want to now put forward the following proposals to help streamline the industry and allow private players to operate easily and profitably. Number one. Reduce central excise duty on ATF from 11% to 0% with immediate effect for both passenger and cargo. Number two, please put in a uniform IGST of 5% for all parts of aircraft and aircraft engines, irrespective of the chapter of the Customs Tariff Act 1975 in which the item is covered. Different parts are covered in different chapters, attract different rates of tax. There is no single definition or clear interpretation of what is an aircraft part and what is a whole. Is an aircraft engine part or a whole? There is no clarity. Number three, discontinue GST on engines repaired abroad, allow ITC. The India currently has negligible MRO capacity. MRO is maintenance, repair and operations. We don't have domestic capability. So airlines have to take their engines abroad for repairs, whether in warranty or under warranty. Once you take an engine abroad for repairs under warranty, you repair it, you re-import it, you have to pay GST on it. So remove the GST on, on repair on engines under warranty. When there's no warranty and the repair engine is re-important, slap uniform 5% GST on it. We need to do this till domestic MRO capacity is built up, please. Number four, currently airlines pay GST under the reverse charge mechanism RCM. But during COVID, we saw that ticket cancellations were often higher than ticket bookings and GST credit accumulated. Airlines have fixed monthly expenditure and there's a monthly addition to input tax credit. What the industry needed was liquidity. 
And here we had a situation where there was a huge amount of credit accumulation combined with sticky cash flows. So please defer RCM tax payments for six months till we get back to normal. Financing. We saw during COVID, several airlines in India had approached their bankers for support, but bankers could not extend any funding to the industry except under the emergency credit line guarantee scheme, which was very restrictive. Let us have a mechanism where funds should be provided to airlines based on their financial strength, based on their ability to repay. And the government, with all due respect, should stop focusing on building so many new airports in a race for bragging rights and instead focus on increasing capacity and facilities at existing airports. Most major airports are operating at 85 to 120% of handling capacity. This is a safety issue. Terminals at Bagdogra, Jodhpur are ancient, tiny. Airports like Srinagar, Leh have no proper aircraft de-icing facilities, very primitive landing and navigation. Let us fix the basics. The only new airport, major airport, commissioned and built after 14 is the upcoming Goa and Mopa airport. The rest are all new terminals, but all built under the previous regime, which rightly focused on increasing capacity at major hubs. The most important thing is air safety. We have a 19% shortage of air traffic control personnel capacity. The sanction strength is 3901. We currently have 3162. Airports Authority says, with Uran and many Tier 2 and Tier 3 unused airports getting revived, we need another 300 to 500 ATCOs immediately. In Delhi, the mandatory break after 30 minutes is now two hours. In Guwahati, they work 365 days without a break. The AAI sought exemption from the DGCA for the third time in the last one year from implementing the mandatory shift timings that were to come into effect from November 2020. The UN Aviation Safety Watchdog put these checks in place in 18, and our last exemption, India's last exemption, expired on January 31st, 2022. January 12th. The Honourable Minister, your predecessor, said in Parliament when he was explaining the need for privatisation that the government cannot be in the business of running airlines. Well, now that you're out of it, it is only fair that you create a level playing field for those private operators who are running airlines. Merge the ministry, do away with a separate demand for grants, reduce duties on ATF, or better still, bring it under GST. And finally, as I end, I would like to quote former Prime Minister Vajpayee in 1972, who said in Parliament, These days the atmosphere in New Delhi makes one choke. It is not easy to breathe freely. The chanting of a Prime Minister's name on All India Radio from morning to night saturated propaganda on cinema screens. How can people sitting in opposition fight this? It is India's greatest day, a tragedy perhaps, that the very party Vajpayee ji led as Prime Minister today leads a government that has turned this very same parliament into the Colosseum in Rome in the first century, where like a gladiator, the Honorable Prime Minister enters to chants of Modi, Modi. And sadly, those entrusted with the decorum of this house, the garima, as they like to put it, smile smugly through it all. So today, as a woman parliamentarian, let me chant some names that truly deserve applause, both in this house and in the annals of civil aviation history of India. The first Indian woman to get a pilot's license, Urmila Parekh. The first woman commercial pilot, Prem Mathur. The first woman pilot of Indian Airlines, Durba Baraji. The first woman IF officer to fly in a combat zone, Gunjan Saxena. The captain of the first Boeing having an all-women flight crew, Sadamani Deshmukh. The youngest pilot in civil aviation history to command a jet aircraft, Nivedita Basin. And on this celebratory note, my esteemed colleagues, let us do what needs to be done. Keep the Maharaja out of the skies by all means, but let's keep the Ahmadmi flying high. Jai Hind. Thank you very much.